The scripture I'm going to read today comes from the book of Acts. It's chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. And uh, we, we hear in this reading that uh, Peter is performing some miracles. I invite you to listen to this. Book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. Now as Peter went here and there among all the believers came down also to the saints living in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Rise, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up, and all the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him and returned to the Lord. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples who had heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she stood up. He gave her his hand, and then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love that part of Acts because we know that Jesus has been arrested, crucified, died, rose three days later. He spent more time with the, the disciples, teaching them further, and then he ascended into heaven. And then as the disciples were waiting, the Holy Spirit came and descended upon them, blessed them, and many came to know the Lord. Uh, the church began, the disciples became apostles, meaning they became teachers, and they went out and they began to minister and to teach the word of God. What I love about this particular text is that Peter is performing some of the very same miracles that Jesus did. And he's doing them in the name of Jesus, not in the name of Peter, not in the name of even the church, <clears throat> but in the name of Jesus Christ. He has a, a, a lame person Rise, pick up your mat and walk, make your bed, come on, get up. And this man who had been lame for eight years did. And then Tabitha or Dorcas who died. Peter comes, says, wake up. And she does. And she gets up. This shows the power of Jesus' name. Peter exclaims these miracles in the name of Jesus Christ. And these miracles take place. There is great power in the name of Jesus. Great power. Now, as Peter is going around, we learn from reading further into Acts that not everybody welcomes him. 
that he is at times uh, known as a, a troublemaker. I want to talk a little bit today about troublemakers. Throughout the course of biblical history, there are recorded the lives of men and women who have changed the very fabric of humanity. They have stood in the face of popular opinion. They've argued against that which has always been known. Uh, they were often ostracized and scorned ridiculed and persecuted, and on more than one occasion martyred for their belief. Their journey was often a lonely one. It can be quite singular to be the only one going upstream while everyone else is coming downstream. And they were oftentimes called troublemakers. Uh, we see the world the word troublemaker in both our Old Testament and New. Uh, and it comes from the understanding or definition as one who stirs the pot, one who confronts the people and does not conform to the common viewpoint or perspective or understanding. In the book of Kings, Ahab, a wicked king of Israel, this is long before Jesus was born. Ahab, who had married Jezebel and who worshipped Baal and Asherah and subsequently led most of Israel to worship and serve Baal, said to the prophet Elijah, when Elijah was brought before him, Is that you, you troublemaker of Israel? He this wicked king of Israel, saw Elijah as a troublemaker. And it was Elijah who would then confront the prophets of Baal, challenging them and beating them, and ultimately bringing the people of Israel back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the book of Acts, in chapter 24, the high priest Ananias goes before or goes to a Caesarea with elders from the church as well as a legal expert or a, a lawyer in church law. Not, not for a pleasant visit, not for lemonade and cookies, uh, but to bring charges against the Apostle Paul. Charges that they would make to the governor, Governor Felix. Tertullus, who was the lawyer, the legal expert, said to Felix, We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you. and Your insight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with uh, profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. And Paul was being declared a troublemaker, and their intent was to have Paul imprisoned or executed by Governor Felix because they did not have the authority themselves to do anything against Paul. And so we see from Noah to Isaac and Moses, from Eve to Sapphira and Rahab, from John the Baptist to the Apostle Paul to Peter, and Mary, mother of Jesus, to Mary of Bethany, to Mary Magdalene, troublemakers, all of them. And, of course, troublemakers are not limited to the Bible. We see them in our contemporary lives quite often. Caesar, Estrada, Chavez, born and died in Arizona, fought for farm workers. In 1962, he created National Farm Workers Association, which grew into the United Farm Workers of America in 1971 fighting for farmers' rights. Robert Smith, a billionaire CEO, 
gave $34 million to retire the debt of the entire 2019 graduating class of Morehouse College. Latosha Brown, who comes from a family of farmers who worked the soil of the Black Belt of Alabama, growing vegetables and cotton, who grew up in Selma, the launching uh, place, the, the starting place for the, the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965 with over 25,000 people participating, which then led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. She's the co-founder of Black Voters Matter. And she uses her voice, her singing voice, with spirituals and freedom songs and gospel and Americana to share her message. Now, each of these troublemakers have two things uh, in common. One, they upset the people around them. Whether our Old Testament or new or contemporary uh, figures, we, they upset the people around them. And then two, they do not do this for their own sake but for the sake of the people, for the betterment of the downtrodden, social outcast, the least of these, hungry and thirsty, impoverished, sick and imprisoned and abused and taken advantage of and martyred. They upset the people around them, but not for their sake, for the sake of those who need help. And yet of all these people, and of all those who similarly cause trouble, they bow to the master troublemaker, Jesus Christ. Now I, I say that without a touch of irony, or an ounce of disrespect, or demeaning posturing, rather a recognition of the truth, Jesus Christ was the greatest troublemaker our world has ever known and ever will know. He was holiness. There was no sin in him. He exuded love and care, and, and yet people hated him with an intensity that led to killing him. Why? The Bible tells us that Jesus went about doing good. He healed the sick, cast out demons, cleansed lepers, gave sight to the blind and legs to the lame, uh, the good news of God's love to the poor and the word of God to all. And in doing so, he made the comfortable very uncomfortable. Uh, Finley Peter Dunn once said that Jesus came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Now, we don't always think of our relationship with God in those terms, uh, but sometimes God does not want us to be comfortable. We might pray to God, God, help me, please. And in our minds, we're asking God to get rid of that which is discomforting us. And we might assume that God wants us to be happy and comfortable and satisfied. This makes sense, right? Our God is a loving God, so this makes sense. And I believe this is mostly true, partially true, essentially true, in the ultimate sense. But our Bible talks about how important our discomfort is to God. Sometimes God wants you to be uncomfortable. God created us for so much more than happiness, at least in our traditional sense or understanding of happiness. Think of those times in our lives when you've accomplished the most or had a, a life-altering connection with someone. 
Chances are those moments happened uh, when you were being challenged physically, emotionally, relationally, financially. You had to work harder, uh, strive more, dig deeper, and as a result you felt more alive. The fulfillment that you received in return was all the more valuable because of the discomfort you felt along the way. Jesus spoke often about the importance of our discomfort. In the Beatitudes, he called people blessed or blessed. Blessed are those who are grieving or hungry or poor in spirit or suffering persecution because of me, because of Jesus. Many times Jesus asked pointed questions or told stories that truly bothered those who were listening. Now some of these people, especially the sick or the children, loved being around Jesus. But others, especially many of the learned and the leaders, couldn't wait to get rid of him. Jesus made them extremely uncomfortable. You know the story. He was arrested and brought before Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pontius Pilate. And when the people were asked if they wanted to pardon Jesus, their response was, crucify him. And they did. They crucified the troublemaker. Isn't that what we do to troublemakers? We crucify them? Now keep in mind, I'm defining troublemakers with the, the two caveats upsetting the people around them for altruistic reasons. We may not literally crucify troublemakers today, but troublemakers can be crucified in their communities socially, certainly on social media, or in the news, or by word of mouth, or even within the church. We are told that God handed Jesus over to death according to God's plan, and that Jesus willingly laid down his life for the sheep. He who knew no sin became sin for us. It makes us the troublemakers. And yet Jesus was troubled in our place. We hear him exclaim that he's troubled, or we read about him being troubled a number of times. In the book of John, chapter 12, Now my heart is troubled, he exclaims. In John, chapter 13, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. In Christ, God's anger is turned away. In Christ, God's grace is given to all who repent and would follow Him. In Christ, He took our trouble away. First, Jesus troubles us in order to comfort and heal us. That's something to think about, to ponder, to let soak in. Let me say that again because it's important for us to hear. First, Jesus troubles us in order to comfort and heal us. Behind all of fallen humanity is the devil. He is the evil troublemaker who comes to destroy. And he deceives us at times into thinking, my, my father is a troublemaker, my mother is a troublemaker, my teacher is a troublemaker, my pastor is a troublemaker. Or above all, God is a troublemaker. While we indeed are troublemakers, and not in a good sense, 
especially if we are following the devil's ways, there is comfort and hope in knowing that Christ has come and defeated him. Jesus, the true troublemaker, is the one who loves us, who through that love and grace calls us to follow him, much like he called his first disciples. Come, follow me. Oh, we all we need to do is say yes. <clears throat> All we need to do is say yes. <laughs> I'll follow this troublemaker. <laughs> All the way. Thanks be to God.